Keep yourself in the loop of everything football on the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. The latest news on and off the field, be it college football, Big Ten, SCC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, to the NFL. We've got you covered. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC Football Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. As you all know, I am your host, Kayvon Uzami. Hope everyone's having a fantastic week. A happy New Year, a Merry Christmas, happy holidays um, to all of you out there. Hope you're having a good time relaxing, whether you're with friends, family, or doing it solo because of the circumstances that we're in this year I hear you I understand it's been tough and I know we're all really excited to turn that page forward and go to 2021 hopefully as we get you know into the earlier mid parts of 2021 we can start to get back to some normalcy start to get back to um the lives that we all remembered before this COVID mess happened. It, it's kind of crazy and hard to think back that far ago and was like, what was life? Because now this has become such a routine, which is unfortunate, but that is what it is. And uh, now it's time to turn the page forward and hope for a much, much better year than we had in 2020. Um, that That's really all we can hope for. Keep our heads and our feet moving forward. Be positive. Be happy and try and show and shine that positivity and that happiness on others to make their day as best as possible. We are, with all that being said, heading into week 17. Can you believe it, ladies and gentlemen? Week 17? Um, I mean, think about it. When we first started doing these podcasts, it was in the off season. I think we're on episode number 48, 49 now. We're getting close to that big old 50 mark. And when we started doing this podcast... We were talking about, okay, first, are we going to have a season? Second, okay, we're going to have a season, but what's that season going to look like? Well, now we're in phase three here where it's like we had a season, and it was an up-and-down season, but we got to play every single game so far, which is fantastic. And that is, again, I say it over and over, but that is huge props to the NFL, the players, the coaches, everyone involved who has made so much sacrifices Um so that I can sit up here and that you can sit at home and watch football games and I can sit up here and talk about football games. Um, So we should be very thankful for that to get that type of entertainment this season. And we've got it for 17 weeks and it's been great football for all 17 weeks. As Or we've got it for 16 as we head into week 17 here. So, so that's awesome, right? And now we get to talk about the fun stuff. Look, I love the regular season. And I'm sad that it's over. But now we get into the playoffs, and and that's where you make your money, right? That's where we find out who's the real ones to stay and who are the frauds that are going to leave early. And it's going to be a fun, fun postseason in both conferences. But before we can get to the postseason, we still got to figure out who the heck is in. We already know, you know, the Chiefs, they locked up their first round by. They're in the Bills absolutely on fire, probably the best team in the NFL right now, maybe the most hottest team in the NFL besides the Green Bay Packers. They're up there as well. Um, Those two teams are rolling. They're in. Um, Both of them are in. The Pittsburgh Steelers, they got back on their track of winning ways uh, this week when they had a very sloppy, ugly first half against the Indianapolis Colts, down 21-7. Next thing you know, they come back in the second half. Big Ben looks like the Big Ben that we saw in weeks 1 through 10, 1 through 11. He looked much better. 
when they were on that 11-0 run, he was throwing dimes, Deontay Johnson, Juju was finally getting involved, it was more, it was less talk, more play, more uh, actual stats and touchdowns happening on the field for Juju, which is all we were asking for when we talked about that last week, so the Steelers got back on track, so we know a lot of the teams that are going to be into the playoffs, right, that have already locked things up, um, crazy as it is though, as we head into week 17 here, the the AFC, yes, the one seed is locked up. It's the Kansas City Chiefs. They went 14-1. and one. They almost lost last week to my Atlanta Falcons. They, they've really been struggling, and I put air quotes around struggling because they're still winning games, but they're just not doing it in the normal Chiefs fashion that we've all been looking forward to, them, to looking at them do for the last, what, 15 weeks if you include uh, – last season's playoff run, the way they were playing. So they've slowed down, they've tapped the brakes, but we also know that they're a team that can turn it on real quick as well. So are we really worried about them? I don't know. We'll get into that. But they're locked up in the one seed in the AFC. NFC, not so much. Now the Packers are the one seed right now. All they have to do is win at Chicago and they're in. But Chicago's playing for a playoff spot. So there's a lot on the line. They're going to play their stars. They're going to play. They're going to see how this game goes. We know that. Also, when it comes to the wild card spots for both both teams, right, both uh, divisions or conferences, I should say, who's going to get it? Is Indianapolis been a great team all year, 10-5? and five. Are they going to get left out? Think about how crazy this is. You don't really think about it like this when you go through a long 17-week schedule. What happened week one? We all remember this week one so far away now. It feels like it was forever ago. Week one, the Indianapolis Colts were nine point favorites as they head in as they went down to Jacksonville, Florida. They lost to Gar- uh, Garner Minshew and the Jacksonville Jaguars. One of the biggest week one upsets in recent memory for the NFL, right? They ended up turning their season around. Very good football team. Had a lot of respectable wins around uh, as they went through the, the seasons here, uh, the week, week by week. They ended up 10-5, and five, and they're sitting outside of the playoffs right now, and they do not control their own destiny. Think about how different this would be if they would have won that game that they should have won week one. It's crazy to think about it because it's week one. It's so Both teams are so different now. That's the only game Jacksonville has won. All year, now they have officially locked up that one seed, uh, that number one, excuse me, not the one seed, the complete opposite, the number one uh, draft pick. So they will get Mr. Sunshine. They will get Clemson, uh, my man Trevor Lawrence down in Clemson, which is awesome for them. Congrats to that organization. That is franchise changing, literally. Um, But now will the Colts make it in? I don't know. That's something we're going to have to talk about. That's something we're going to have to see as they head in to week 17 here. The Browns, you know, the Browns are looking to make the playoffs for the first time since 2008, I think it is. And they've won 10 games. And they might not make Imagine that. Imagine the Browns going 10-6 and six and not making the playoffs. That would only happen to Cleveland, right? That really would. Well, they choked the bed last week against the New York Jets, who have been playing tough, um, hard, knows, cared about, you know, free-spirited, but really putting it out there. Football as of late, they knocked off the Rams, then they go and knock off the, the Browns, and now the Browns have to win this week. Well, lucky to them, the Pittsburgh Steelers were fe- feeling in the Christmas spirit, and they gift-wrapped them a playoff spot by saying, we're going to rest Big Ben and we're going to play Mason Rudolph. Baker Mayfield, this is a message to you. We're going to get into this much more. Cleveland Browns, this is a message to you. Do not lose this game to the Big ben Steelers. If you lose to Mason Rudolph and you ruin the season that you guys have had, you're not going to get let down. I mean, you will not forget about that moment. People will not let you forget about it. This is a must-win game. This is what we like to call where it's time to step up and show what you're made of. Okay, And it shouldn't take much. It really should not. You got to do it. You got to do it. And we'll see if they can. So a lot on the line there in the AFC. Ravens, Dolphins, Titans, all of them are in must-win scenarios pretty much. And then you get to the NFC. You got the Rams, the Bears, the Cardinals. 
Washington, Dallas, the Giants, the perfect NFC metaphor, right? Coming down to the last week of the season, all of these teams other than the Eagles at 6-9, and nine, who is going to make the playoffs? Who's going to win that NFC East? And then who's going to get the final, the final wild card spot? Is it going to be Chicago, who is now playing much better as of late with Mitchell Trubisky? If they just listen to me all season, I said, Matt Nagy, you are putting your team in a terrible position by benching Mitchell Trubisky after he already took this team 3-0. and you're, you're putting your team in a terrible spot. What happens? They, they, they fall off the rails. They look like an anemic offense. They can't move the ball down the field. And then finally, he brings Mitchell Trubisky back in. Yes, they beat up on bad competition, but at least they're looking good while they do it, and at least they're winning games. Can they get in? I don't know. It might be too late. We'll find out. The Rams, the Cardinals, they are literally limping into this final week of the seasons. season. Jared Goff will be out. He, he uh, had surgery on his thumb. Honestly, that might be better for the Rams. That He's been awful as of late. And Kyler Murray is banged up as well, but it looks like he's going to play. Both are in. You win, and you, you're in scenarios. All right? Can they make it? We'll find out. Those are big, big storylines that we're going to talk about as we go through the show. But I want to do a flip-flop here, and I want to start the show, finish this first segment by talking about something else. And that's a big, big storyline that has happened this week, and that is the Washington football team has released former first-round pick Dwayne Haskins. If we all remember, Dwayne Haskins was taken in the draft two years ago. Daniel Jones went number six overall, and Dwayne Haskins was the second quarterback off the board. They, he went later in that round down at number 16 overall. If you guys remember, going into that draft, a lot of people thought that Dwayne Haskins should have been a top five pick, a top 10 pick, and, and he ended up, as many analysts and experts thought, that he slipped, and he slipped r- really far down the draft, and it was like, oh my, Washington got a huge steal to get him at 15 overall, uh, Washington was his childhood team, it just felt like it was perfect, right? And since then, 2019, when that happened, uh, a lot of things have just gone bad. It's gone wrong. And uh, mainly, it's been Haskins, Dwayne Haskins' fault himself. Now, uh, it's not all his fault. You know, he hasn't been, he wasn't put in the best situation uh, up until this point. Uh, but this year, he, he, you know, under Ron Rivera, maybe you, a lot of people could say he never really had a shot because Ron Rivera came in there already believing that Haskins was not his guy and you could tell that from day one he had no faith in Haskins he clearly did not like Haskins um, as a player uh, as a person that's a whole different thing I was not in that locker room I don't know but he clearly did not have faith in Haskins to get the job done and you could tell that by the way he was hesitant of announcing him as the starter you could tell that by the way he pulled him after four games you could tell that by the way he just went about playing Haskins all throughout the season. I mean, for goodness sakes, they put a guy who almost lost his leg a couple years ago out there instead of putting Dwayne Haskins back out there. They punished him a couple times. It's just been a, a, a horrendous season for Dwayne Haskins, and it led to him getting cut this year. Now, I want to play a soundbite for you guys from Booger McFarland. All of you that follow sports pretty well, which you most likely do if you're listening to this show, know that Booger McFarlane, uh, he works for ESPN. He was in the um, broadcasting Monday night booth for a couple years, and now he works on the Monday night football pregame show. And he does a bunch of other things for ESPN. Um, I find him a good analyst. A lot of people did not think he was the best Monday night football uh, television broadcaster, Um I thought he was fine, but I do think he's a good analyst. But he shared um, some very poignant stuff, some 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 fire. You know, he, it was great for television. And this this makes you think. Now, I, even if you don't entirely agree with what he says, um, this will make you think, and this will certainly make you react to what Booger McFarland said last night on ESPN Monday Night Countdown. Um, Booger McFarland went in this direction when it pertains to Dwayne 
Haskins. All right, so I'm going to play this for you guys here one second. Oftentimes, young players, especially, and I'm going to go here, especially young African-American players, they come into this league and they ask themselves the wrong thing. They come into the league saying not, how can I be a better player? They don't say, how can I be a better teammate? They don't say, how can I be a better person? How can I get my organization over the hump? Here's what they come in saying. How can I build my brand better? How can I build my social media following better? How can I work out on Instagram and show everybody that I'm ready to go, but when I get to the game, I don't perform? Dwayne Haskins, unfortunately, is not the first case that I've seen like this. Yes. And, and it won't be the last. They come in, and they don't take this as a business. It is still a game to them. Look at this as football. It, this ain't football, right. man. This is a billion-dollar business. Yes. It's billions of dollars. They play a child's game and get paid a king's ransom. And, and, and it bothers me because I saw Jamarcus Russell do it. The number one pick in the draft, they gave it $40 million, and he threw it down the damn drain because he didn't take it seriously. My message to the Wayne Haskins, not just him, but the rest of the young players in the NFL, until you start coming to work saying, you know what, how can I put my organization first instead of my damn Instagram? Take it as a a serious business, but too many times, it's a game. We want to TikTok, we want to do all these different things. Man, do you understand how much money is at stake? Wow. Woo! Booger McFarlane coming with the absolute fire. I mean, the absolute fire on ESPN Monday Night Countdown right before the Monday Night game gets uh, with between the Buffalo Bills and the New England Patriots. And I'll tell you what, if any of you guys watched that game, what Booger just was talking about was way more entertaining than what that game was because the Patriots were pathetic and the Buffalo Bills absolutely routed them. Um, and that's something we'll get into next segment. But look, listen. I want to go here because the reason I wanted to play that soundbite was this. It was great TV. All right, Booger, he, 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 he really, he clearly meant what he said. He was passionate about it. He showed the fire. He showed his enthusiasm behind it. You, you could tell it actually meant the, the words he was saying he cared about. And I respect that. I really do. I really, really do. I don't agree with it necessarily, though. And, and this is from what I'm saying. Listen, not once have I viewed the Dwayne, the Dwayne Haskins situation through a prism of race um, or race specific, race related. There's a lot of un, there's a lot to unpack there. There really is. Um, and, and this is why I didn't really I, I never thought of it through a race uh, spectrum. First of all, the, the reason I never looked at it through a race related issue is because Johnny Manziel did the exact same thing, e- even worse, actually. Um, Baker Mayfield is doing the same thing right now, you know, trying to be socially relevant with all those commercial endorsements and everything else but while also playing football. The only difference is Baker is actually having success on the field right now. Baker is playing well. I, I honestly don't think this has anything to do, though, with Haskins being too obsessed or cares, cares too much about his social media following, following, or and, and the quote unquote Instagram famous, internet famous thing that we always talk about, right? I have never viewed it that way. Now, to me, this is much more about two different things. First of all, he's immature. He's immature. He wasn't ready for this moment. He he he's young. He's not taking it seriously. So all of that stuff that Booger said is completely spot on. He's right about that. He is immature. He doesn't understand what's at stake. He's not taking it as a job. He's taking it much more as a, it's a it's it's just kind of something that he it's there, right? He was able to get to this point. Whoop de do. That's awesome. Let me go have fun. That that's I do agree with that. And from what from what Ber- Booger's saying in that perspective, um, I don't think it had. I don't. I don't even think. Dwayne Haskins and you know has a very robust um maybe he does because he's a starting quarterback in the NFL but like I don't I never view Dwayne Haskins as that guy that is overly impressed overly enamored with being a social media icon I never got that feeling or impression you know who I do get that feeling about Odell Beckham Jr. right I get that impression with Odell you know who else Juju Smith-Schuster I get that impression with Juju Smith I got that impression with Baker Mayfield or um with Johnny Manziel back in the day. Like 
Those are the guys that care so much about their brand and, and their internet famous, quote unquote, all that type of stuff, right? I never really got that with Haskins. You know, if you want to come out and say Dwayne Haskins just doesn't work hard enough, he, he, he's lazy, maybe he doesn't think very well before he acts, he doesn't care, he's throwing it away, I would 100% jump on board with that. And to a point, Booger McFarlane did kind of say that, and I jump on board to that part. Um, a wasted opportunity, there's no doubt about that. This is, to me, a Dwayne Haskins wasn't prepared for the moment issue to me. That's all it is. That, that's what it is to me. And, you know, I said this two years ago when he got drafted. I said, look, this guy could be a great player. He could. He was the man for one year at Ohio State. One year, guys. And he was pretty good, no doubt. He, he, was a, he was a stud. But if you go back and look at that season, they really didn't beat anyone good that year. Anyone super impressive. I mean, that's just what it is. They won the Big Ten Championship game against a decent Northwestern team, and he looked good. He did, but it was one year, and now we see he clearly should have stayed in school, and then you, if you remember draft night that year, Dwayne Haskins actually fell, um, it, he fell in the draft. Many people thought he was going to go top five or top ten, and he fell all the way to 15. Uh, he fell to 15, and a lot of people think he he got saved at 15, actually, because of Daniel Snyder, and he's a Maryland kid, and he went to school with Snyder's son, all that stuff. I, I remember all this talk and these articles written. So they knew like it, it, was, it was just a personal relationship, and maybe Haskins kind of took for granted, took granted for that, right? That, that's a possibility. And look, what Book said on TV, I mean... It was great TV. Again, he had the passion. I appreciate the passion. I appreciate it. I appreciate the candor. I appreciate the directness. I thought it was really good stuff. But I just don't fully agree with, with most of what he said. I, I don't view it through a race-specific prison. Certain things, you have to. This one was not it for me. This, this was not one of them for me. I, I, I want to throw a bunch of names out there for you guys, okay? Ryan Leaf. Johnny Manziel, Matt Leiner, Kyle, uh, Kyle Bowler, David Carr, Joey Harrington, David Kingler, Todd Black, Todd ba Blackledge back in the day, Blaine Gabbard. We could play this game all day. Those are some of the, those are just a, a minute amount of names who were overdrafted. They were just simply overdrafted, and their talents were inflated by the personnel department. That they saw something that, that they saw something that wasn't there. Hence, they were overdrafted. You know, some had some. They either had offensive, uh, terrible offensive lines, like in the case of David Carr. You never really recover from getting bad habits early on in your career as in the NFL, right? And you get those bad habits from having bad offensive lines or bad coaches or instability in the front office, a, a constant revolving door of other of coaches coming in and out or dealing with injuries or not having a good receiving core. Like all of that stuff happens and all of that goes into being overdrafted at times, right? That there that we all understand that. I get that. And and listen, some guys and it, it might sound harsh, but some guys they just lack the requisite talents to cut it loose and be a stud at the most important position in sports. I mean, at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, it's that simple. So look, we, we could I can stand up here and we can try to attribute these failures to growing up in a, a social media society in 2020. But to me, it's not about that. Because others are doing just fine. Deshaun Watson is growing up right in front of our eyes. He's having a tough, tough season down in Houston in terms of having his first real losing season as an NFL player. He's basically the same age, a little bit older than Dwayne Haskins. But he's grown up at the same period, through the same society, the same social media, all that stuff. Josh Allen, remember Josh Allen? There were a couple of tweets uncovered on draft day from high school that had to do with race, or I don't want to say race, but that they were framed differently by some, and, and thankfully, you know, well, 
first he had to apologize, but thankfully we were able to move on from that. He had to apologize, which he did. He had to own up to it, which he embraced it. And, and, and then obviously his boys love him now and the team loves him. He's the leader of the team and we know what's happened with Josh from here. I mean, everybody's path is different. And let me be very, very clear. I'm not standing up here trying to say you can't have fun. You can't be on social media, blah, blah, blah. I'm not trying to be that guy, nor I ever, will I ever be that guy. I don't believe that's, that's right to say. You have your fun. You have to embrace the opportunities that you're given. You have to be yourself even more importantly. And you sure as heck won't hear me raining on your parade as the old man get off my lawn if you're bawling out. That's a fact. You do your job, you have as much fun as you want. I'm all for that. It's when you're not performing anymore is when I have a problem. My point is, you, you are either equipped to handle the rigors of the position of being an NFL quarterback, ladies and gentlemen. The biggest and toughest position in all of sports. Okay, You are either able to handle that type of position, deal with the expectations placed on your shoulder the moment they hold up the jersey and you're a first-round pick as a quarterback, the moment that big check goes right into your bank account, the money, the fame, and everything that comes with it. And then it comes down to that you can either lead a group of men down the football field and score touchdowns and win ball games, or you can't. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen, maybe Dwayne Haskins just can't do that. Have we ever thought that maybe he just isn't good enough? And you know what? That is okay. That is completely okay. And listen, that's just as of now. That does not mean that can't change. Because we have to remember, I said it earlier and I'll say it again. He was at Ohio State for one year. And it was relatively easy too. It was a very easy year. They lost. They only lost one game all year. He had 59 touchdowns or something like that. 50 touchdowns. He broke Drew Brees' Big Ten record for most touchdowns in a season. Like it was so easy for him. It was so easy. But he didn't learn how to deal with adversity. And he didn't learn how to deal with being like the guy, the man. So he goes to the NFL and he thinks it's going to be easy and it's not. This is why it's good to see players play at least two years in college because everyone is geared up for you that next year, right? Do you still excel or do you crumble? After you have a big, big year, your first year in college, everyone's ready to go. Everybody knows you're coming. Are you still able to excel or do you crumble? And I think we saw, what we saw was Dwayne Haskins has concerns crumbling because he thought it was going to be easy and it's not on this level. If there's one thing that I can take from Booger, it's you got to work hard no matter what. And you know, it's still a job, dude. It's still a job. And as the quarterback, you have others depending on you as well, whether it's to lead them or to get them involved so they can ball out, whatever. You have responsibilities. And, you know, when I hear Dwayne Haskins speak, I don't hear at least a lot of, you know, a a lack of perspective or awareness. And I certainly don't hear a lack of intelligence. You know, he's a very well-spoken young man. He's a smart kid. You can tell he's got a head on his shoulders. And you know what? Again, at the end of the day, he just might not be good enough. And there is nothing wrong with that at all. At all. There's a lot of guys that just can't do this job. And look, he still has time to turn this around. The book is not written fully, and it's not closed just yet. And I am all for second chances. And he deserves a second chance. But he needs to turn it around quick. He needs to turn it around quick. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. I am your host, Kayvon Izami. Sorry, it went a little overboard there in the segment one. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll dive much more into things going on into week 17 and the college football playoff 
this upcoming weekend. We'll be right back after this. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. I am your host, Kayvon Izami. Hope everyone's having a great, great week. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. As we roll into 2021, let's put 2020 behind us. Hope we have some good New Year's resolutions this year. Um, you know, I, I always try and come up with one. It's, it depends how long, you know, I really put in the effort to see how long it lasts. But we'll see, we shall see. Definitely got to get back into a little bit of working out for me since this pandemic has hit. Um, I've, I've dropped off in, 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 in going to the gym as much, obviously, because it, it was closed, the pandemic. And um, it just hasn't felt safe, hasn't felt right to me. So I, I do do some Peloton at home. Um, I don't have the bike. I wish I did. The bike is, is, is awesome. And one day that is a goal of mine to get that bike for sure. Um, but I do the, you know, they have a bunch of different classes uh, weight, weight lifting classes, cardio classes. It's pretty awesome. All you need is a couple weights, nothing serious at all. And, and, uh, nothing like you don't have to go buy anything. It's super expensive. Just need a couple different weights. Maybe, you know, one of those stretch bands, um, to, to, if you, if you like those better than weights, but it's really cool. They, they give, they give you a fantastic workout for such little material to have, which is what I like. And that's what you kind of need during these tough times when you don't want to go out and spend a bunch of money on, you know, a bench press or, or, or a bunch of weights, which are super expensive and stuff like that. So I've been doing those, but I definitely need to get back into really working out every single day, every morning, like I was before this whole pandemic has hit. Um, so that that's going to be one of my New Year's resolution. Pretty um, cliche, cheesy one. I think almost everyone says, oh, I'm going to get in shape. I, I I know I hear it all the time. The gyms get busy for the first month of February. Then you drop off. I know the deal. I've been through it, but we'll, we'll see if I can get it going here. Hope you all have some good new year's resolutions. Um, hit me up on Twitter at Kayvon underscore sports. Let me know what they are. Love to talk about them with you here on air or just through Twitter, um, DMs, whatever, send me a text, you know, I'll give you my number. Uh, lots to talk about though. Look, we've got jam packed sports world sports weekend, right? I mean, think about it. We've got the bowl games going on this week right now. Uh, tomorrow we've got the cotton bowl, Oklahoma, Florida, uh, Florida has a bunch of wide receivers. Their, their star tight end, uh, Kyle Pitts, the, all of these guys have opted out. They are getting ready for the draft, which is smart. Um, because right now I am watching a bowl game. I think this is the Cheez-It Bowl, which makes me hungry because they've got like these little Cheez-Its all over the place and they keep showing these Cheez-It commercials. Um, but as I do this show, I'm watching the Cheez-It Bowl, Oklahoma State versus Miami. And Derek King, Miami's really good dual threat running back who just announced that he is coming back to Miami next year, which is awesome for Miami because Miami went 8-2 and two with him. They had a really good season um, with him under center, and he just got hurt. You can just tell he hurt his knee pretty bad to the point where he had to get carted off the field, ladies and gentlemen. 
And this is why, this is why right here, I get, I just don't understand and I get frustrated with people who get on these players for not playing in their bowl games. It makes no sense to me. Why or why do you care if these players are playing in these bowl games? Now listen, if they're sitting out of the national championship game, if they're sitting out of the college semifinal game, that's different. And I don't mean to downplay these bowls like the Cotton Bowl and the Cheez-Its Bowl because these are still big-time bowls that bring in a lot of money and a lot of these players um, are very thankful to get to play in that bowl, as they should be. But that doesn't mean that they have to play in it, especially the one percenters that are going to be drafted in the NFL. Why? Because of the Jalen Smith story. When Jalen Smith, who right now was a miraculously able to overcome this injury, he's the linebacker of the Dallas Cowboys, he was a top five pick out of Notre Dame. He was having one of the best seasons we've seen. Beast of a linebacker. Top five pick. Wasn't going to go, was, there was no chance he was going to fall past number five. He plays in a New Year's Six Bowl. It's not the college football semifinals. It's not the college, play, it's not the uh, national championship game. It's a New Year's Six Bowl. So it's a cool bowl. It's an important bowl. It's against Ohio State. He plays in it. And he tears his knee up in so many different ways. He doesn't just tear his knee up. He tears the nerves up, tears the ligaments up. They don't know if he's ever even going to be able to run again, regardless of play football. And he luckily was able to recover. He fell. He was such a good player. All the furthest he fell was to the one of the top five picks in the second round. If usually if a player has that injury, they don't even get drafted. But because he was so good, Jerry Jones took a chance on him in the second round. So he missed out on millions and millions and millions of dollars. Look, I'm not I'm not feeling sorry for him. He's worked his way back and now he got a huge contract. But the amount of money at the time that you get from being a top 5 overall pick to a pick in the second round is life-changing. It's it's completely different. Your second round contract's not even fully guaranteed sometimes. The first round one, you're changing your life and your family's life with that. And because he played in this, you know, bowl game that really was pointless for him he lost out on that now luckily this story turned out to be a positive to have a positive ending a happy ending he he was able to recover he was able to be a good football player again he's able to get a big contract with the Dallas Cowboys awesome stuff perseverance he worked hard all of that stuff is great that's not always going to work out that way it's just not and it, it's not always going to have a happy ending like that and I really, really hope, I feel so bad for this kid right now, Derek King. And I really, really hope that he's going to be able to be all right and overcome this injury and be able to be ready to go next year and have a great uh, year, final year at Miami. I, I hope so, because if he got hurt playing in the cheez Bowl and his, his final season in college is, is in jeopardy, that, that would be really unfortunate in, in my eyes. So this is why I get mad at people when they say, when they get mad at these players for sitting out of the bowl games. No, no. Players, look out for yourself. You know why? Because all year, and, and for football, you've been playing with that school most likely for two years, most of the time three years. You've been looking out for the school. You've been playing for the school. You've been playing for the team, your teammates, which is great, your coaches, which is great, and you've been playing for the university. Once your season's over and, and it's just going into bowl season and you're not in the running to play for a national championship game, start to look out for yourself, okay? Because it's, new, it's, it's time to go to the draft. It's time to work to achieve your, your bigger dream of playing in the NFL and being one of those rare, rare 1% players, 1% uh, people in the world of playing in the National Football League. Now, not every player is good enough to go to the NFL. So for those that aren't, then yes, you should be playing in the Cheez-It Bowl because that is an amazing experience and that's probably going to be the last football game you ever play. That's different. I'm talking about the ones that have it and have the chance to make it to the NFL. There's no reason to do that, in my opinion. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. I'm your host, Kayvon Izami. I will now get off my soapbox. 
Just had to go off on that for a little bit because I just saw this live. I mean, I'm, I have a TV in front of me. I'm talking to you guys. I, I watch the games while I talk. I'm able to multitask like that. Yes, no, those of you that know me you might find that as a miracle. You might find that pretty hard to believe. But yes, I can multitask. And um, I, I just saw this poor kid have to get carted off the field. He had a tremendous season for Miami. Put them back on the map. Put them in the top 10. Um and I, I just, I, I, my heart goes out to him. I really, really hope he's okay. I really, really do. Um, we've got another good bowl tonight. Alamo Bowl, Texas at Colorado. A lot of money coming in on Colorado. I personally think Texas wins that game. We've got the Cotton Bowl on Wednesday. And that would be uh, between Florida and Oklahoma. And then we have on New Year's, or, uh, New Year's Day, the college football playoff. We've got the Clemson Tigers in a rematch against the Ohio State Buckeyes. As we all remember last year, that was uh, the semifinal before Clemson ended up winning and going on and losing to LSU. And then in the other game, we've got Alabama against Notre Dame. Now, to me, the sem- college football semifinals are exactly like last year. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean two things. One, Alabama against Notre Dame is like LSU against Oklahoma. Oklahoma had no shot last year. Notre Dame has no shot this year. With all due respect to all of you Notre Dame fans, with all due respect to all of the Notre Dame players and the coaches, this is why we play the game. Why? Because you still have a chance. And anything can happen. And I fully believe that. But for this game, it's going to be all, it's going to take a miracle. It's going to take a lot of things going your way and even more than that to knock off Alabama. Alabama is too good. They're on a they're they're in a class of their own and it's going to take it's going to take uh Notre Dame's best game ever. Ever. Zero mistakes for them to beat Alabama. I just don't see it happening. Vegas doesn't see it happening. That's why they have they are um that's why Alabama is 20 points of, of a favorite. 20 points. That is so much for a semifinal game. It's, it's insane. Um, I, I just do not see that happening. Now, for the second game, that's going to be the fun one. You've got Ohio State taking on Clemson in a rematch, which was the best football game last year, by far. It wasn't the national championship it wasn't any of the games during the regular season. It was this game. And you know what? You have a be- even bigger storyline last year as you did this year. I mean, this year your storyline is much bigger than it was last year. Why? Last year the storyline was Clemson, Trevor Lawrence as a freshman. He wins um, the national championship. He puts every- He puts his name on the map. Everyone's like, this kid is legit. He's special. He hasn't lost a game yet in college to this point. And he still didn't lose the game all the way until it got to the national championship where he lost to LSU, right? Comes back this year, doesn't lose a game again yet this year. The one game they lost, he had COVID, he didn't play. Um, he is the undoubtedly, you know, close your eyes. He is going number one overall. You don't even need to second guess it. Then you have him playing against Justin Fields, who for the majority of this season was the undoubtedly Close your eyes. He is going number two overall. Set it and forget it. Well, one of those storylines has changed as we've gone throughout this season. Which one is it? can tell you what. It sure as heck isn't Mr. Sunshine. He is going number one overall. And he's going from Clemson, South Carolina to Jacksonville, Florida. Because, congratulations to the Jacksonville Jaguars. They got the number one overall pick. The Jets have been playing tough these last couple months. They've won two games in a row now, and they have the number one overall pick. The Jacksonville Jaguars do. So they're taking Trevor Lawrence. That is set in stone. Now, Justin Fields going number two is not set in stone anymore for a couple reasons. One, the New York Jets do like Sam Darnold. They might want to keep trying with him and building with him. Two, Justin Fields has not had a very good season. He just hasn't. This game is so important 
to one player and his draft stock, and that is Mr. Justin Fields. And that's because of a couple of reasons. One, it's because of his drop-off in play. Last year, in 2019, obviously, it was, we didn't, were not going through a pandemic then. He got to play a full season, 14 games. He threw for 3,273 yards, 41 touchdowns, and three interceptions. 41 touchdowns and three interceptions. Remarkable season. This year, they've only got to play six games, and he's thrown for 15 touchdowns and five interceptions. So he has thrown two more interceptions in only six games this year than he did in all of 14 games last year. Now, we just talked about Ohio State, a former Ohio State number one overall or first round pick, Dwayne Haskins, how he had a fantastic year at Ohio State. It only was one year for him. Then he went to the NFL draft and we were saying how we love to see college football players come back from a really good first year, come back, go back to college because now they have a target on their back, right? Now everyone in the football world, the college landscape, the NFL landscape, they know who you are. They're coming to scout you at your games. They're, they're going to be watching you in, in uh, week in and week out. And then the other team, they've seen game film of you for a year. They have film to watch you. They're going to keep up. They're going to go back and watch what you did good. They're going to go back and watch what you did bad. They're going to have more time to game plan against you. We, we can put all this stuff together. You add some pressure. Do you crumble or do you excel? Trevor Lawrence has excelled. Trevor Lawrence had arguably the best rookie season, freshman season you can have as a college football player. Goes in, doesn't lose a game, looks fantastic, looks spotless. Wins a national championship against Tua and Alabama and Nick Saban. I mean, you can't really beat that. He comes back. He's looked just as good ever since. He's never dropped off. He's only lost one game. He's been on the money. It's been awesome, right? Justin Fields, we haven't got to see that. Now, it's only big six games. It hasn't been as much of a sample size. But he's clearly digressed in his play. Against tougher competition, Northwestern, Indiana, he's played bad. He's thrown picks. He's been off the mark. He's not playing. He's not hitting his receivers. Now, against Northwestern, a lot of his top receivers were out because of COVID protocols. Well, in the NFL, you're going to get drafted high. You're not going to have the best receivers as very early. It's just how it is usually, right? It's just how it is. So my question becomes... How important is this game to Justin Fields' draft stock? It's massive. It is massive. And I never want to put too much stake into one game, but this game is massive. Because he's not only going to go up against the toughest uh, competition he's played all year, but he's going up against the guy who's no doubt, close your eyes, put a blindfold, going number one overall, Trevor Lawrence. This is his time to show everyone that he can go to toe-to-toe with that guy. That he can go toe-to-toe with that team. That he can beat Trevor Lawrence. That he can play just as good against Trevor Lawrence. Now, even if they lose, fine. Doesn't matter. You have to play well. You have to play well. It can't be because of you that you lost. If it's that Trevor, Law, if it's that you threw for 350 yards, three touchdowns, zero interceptions, and Trevor Lawrence threw for 350 yards, four touchdowns, and zero interceptions, well, pat yourself on the back, say, boys, we tried our best, and move on to the NFL because that is okay. But if you go out there and Trevor Lawrence throws for 350 yards, four touchdowns, and zero interceptions, and you go out there and you throw for 150, 200 yards, two touchdowns, two interceptions. You turn the ball over. You're you're sloppy with your throws. You're you're not really stepping into your throws. You're off the mark to your receivers. That's a problem. Because this isn't the draft where it's just you and Trevor Lawrence. There's a guy named Zach Wilson at BYU that a lot of people like. There's a guy named Trevor uh, Trey Lance from North Dakota that a lot of people like. There's a guy named 
Kyle Trask from Florida. There's a guy named Mac Jones. I mean, there's a possibility that we have six quarterbacks going in the first round this year in the draft. It's possible. Is it very likely? No, probably more like five. But we could have six quarterbacks go in the first round of this draft. So while a couple of months ago, Justin Fields, it looked all hunky-dory. No matter what, you were going to go to number two overall. No matter what, you were the second best quarterback in this class. Things have changed because your play has dropped off. But all of that can change if you uplift your play on New Year's Day. All of that can change. If you do that against Trevor Lawrence, Mr. Sunshine, across the field. And you do that against a Dabo Sweeney, a Brett Venables defense that that plays a pro-style defense that recruits pro-style players, NFL-ready players, gets them coached up, sends them off so they can go make an impact in the NFL. I mean, this is what Brett Venables has done his entire career. If you can play well against that team... That is going to uplift your draft stock stock, uh, stock, and you're going to be right back into that. Justin Fields must go number two overall conversation because right now it's not there. It's dropped off. And look, you have a great stature, great height and weight. You've got the arm, all that stuff. So, So once you get to the combine, you know coaches are going to fall in love with you. If you go into that combine coming off one of your best performances of your college career against a Clemson team, oh man, people are going to start to really talk about how you're a must-go at number two. It's a huge, huge game for both teams, but it's a really big game for Justin Fields and his draft stock. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. I'm your host, Kayvon Izami. We're going to take a quick break. The show is rolling around along. We're going to go right back, come right back, go into segment number three, and we're going to dive into the NFL as we finish out the last two segments here. Week 17, playoffs on the line, storylines on the line. What's going to happen? Who's going to come out on top? We'll dive into it all right after this. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit GSMC. SMCpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back, welcome back. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. I am your host, Kayvon Izami. As we come down the final stretches of the show, segment number three, quarter number three, we've discussed a lot so far, a lot more to go through um, as we finish these final two segments here. We'll talk more about the playoff um, implications, what's on the line for each team, where do we stand right now with each seeding, is the one seed still available in the NFC? Yes, it is. Wild card spot still available? Yes, they are. Seeding position is still available. Teams are hot. Teams are cold. Um, I mean, this is why the NFL is so great, though. Um, it's it's a truly week by week sport. You know, uh, you open up. If you guys remember, two weeks ago we did a show where 
our opening segment. And as our opening segment, it's always our hottest segment, our biggest topic, our our money grabber, as we always like to call it, something that's really going to get the audience's attention. We talked about how the Los Angeles Rams are set up to make the deepest run in the NFC. Why? Because what do you need when you make playoff runs? In January, in December, January, February, to get to the Super Bowl, you need a couple of things. One, you need a run game. You have to have a run game. Just like last year, the 49ers, if you're going to go to a cold place to play, or even if you're going to play outdoors, no matter if it's warm or cold, you're going to need a run game. The 49ers had that. The Kansas City Chiefs had that. The next thing, you're going to need a good defense, being able to make stops at critical times. Doesn't mean you have to be a lockdown defense, but you have to be a defense that will have turnovers, create pressure on the quarterback, make the quarterback uneasy in the pocket, panicky feet, sacks, turnovers, all that stuff. That's why we liked the Los Angeles Rams two weeks ago after they went into Tampa Bay, they beat the Bucs on Monday Night Football, then they pounded the New England Patriots on Sunday Night Football, or Thursday Night Football, excuse me. Yes, it's the New England Patriots. They're awful this year, but the way they did it was impressive. So we were pretty high on the Rams at the time because of what they did. Now, we said the one downfall for the Rams is they go as Jared Goff goes. Their defense is great. Their run game is great. Their head coach is great. But Jared Goff, can he make the big plays at crucial times? These last couple of weeks, Jared Goff has played awful football. He has looked terrible. He has looked so bad. He looks immobile. He can't run the football. He he, he is not hitting open receivers. He's not hitting receivers in stride. And they've completely fallen off. And now they're in jeopardy of not even making the playoffs. How crazy is that, ladies and gentlemen? Two weeks ago, they were sitting here at 9-3. and three. They just beat the Bucs on Monday Night Football. They beat the Seahawks a couple of weeks ago. They, were, they had the best defense in the league. And then two weeks later, they lose to the New York Jets. And then they lose to the Seattle Seahawks. They do not look good. Jared Goff uh, breaks his thumb. He has to go in to get surgery. He won't be playing in this crucial game, pivotal game, must-win game. Um, And they've completely fallen off. And as much credit as I like to give Sean McVay, because you guys know me, I love me some Sean McVay. He is a special coach. He really is. He has had some issues as of late. He has not had some good coaching as of late, um, especially down at the goal line. I don't know what the heck he's doing, what he's calling when they're at the goal line, but they were inside the three-yard line three or four times against Seattle, and they got stuffed after stuffed after stuff, and he just kept handing it off like they could pound it in. It wasn't working, McVay. You've got to change things up. I don't know what you're doing there. You've got to change things up. The Rams are one of the most interesting teams to me moving forward, and we'll get into this in our offseason shows, but they've, they're they set up to be good for a long period of time. But is Jared Goff going to be their guy? Because I, I it's starting to look more and more like he is not their guy, but they have a really big contract with him on the books that they're not going to be able to get rid of. Um, and and it's, uh, they also have some draft picks that they're not going to have because they trade they traded those away for Jalen Ramsey, which was worth it. Jalen Ramsey has been awesome, one of the best corners in the league, no doubt about that. But the the, the Rams, you know, it, it's been a very interesting season for them. Two weeks ago, we thought they were the best team in the NFC, best set up to win. Now they might not even make the playoffs. That's what makes the NFL so great. It's a week by week. League, the Arizona Cardinals, they were hot in the beginning of the year. Kyler Murray was balling out. He gets hurt, they dropped off. Then they go back up, they win a couple games. Then out of nowhere, they lose to the San Francisco 49ers, a team that is just injury riddled all across the board. They beat them, they're in the playoffs. They don't. Now it comes down to this final week where they have to win to get in. The Chicago Bears, the Chicago Bears, they started out the season 4-1, and one. Then their offense couldn't move the football 10 yards even if they wanted to. They just couldn't. It, it was the worst offense in the league. It was Matt Nagy wouldn't pick his head up and watch the game. He just had his head in the playbook. 
over and over, mistake, mistake, mistake. The defense was getting hung out to dry. Now, Matt Nagy puts some faith in Mitchell Trubisky. Boom, they're back up. Is it too late, though? Do they still have time? Can they knock off the Green Bay Packers? I don't know. These are things that we're going to have to see. I personally do not think the Green Bay Packers are going to allow that to happen. Um, I think that Aaron Rodgers enjoys beating up on Chicago. He enjoys beating up on uh, those Chicago fans and kind of ending their hopes and dreams. Aaron is that kind of dude with that attitude. So I don't see them winning, but Chicago can still get in even if they lose. How? Arizona just has to lose. That's all that has to happen for Chicago. Win or lose, as long as the Arizona Cardinals lose to the Rams, Chicago is in. Now, the unfortunate part for Chicago, the Rams will not have Jared Goff. Even though I just went on about how bad Goff is, they're going to be starting a quarterback, John Wofford, out of Wake Forest, who has never played a down in the NFL before. I, you just, It's going to be hard to beat Kyler Murray, even if he is banged up, and the Arizona Cardinals. That, that That's going to be really hard to do, right? So we'll see what happens there. Those are some really big storylines moving forward in the NFC in particular, as well as you have what's going on with the top seeds. Right now, you got the Green Bay Packers sitting there at 12-3. and three. You got the New Orleans Saints at 11-4. and four. You got the Seattle Seahawks at 11-4, and four, and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at 10-5. and five. Green Bay has the head-to-head over New Orleans. So they're kind of in the clear there, right? Like, even if they lose, the only way they would give up that one spot is if the Saints and the Seahawks both win. The Saints are already resting a lot of their players. Um, So we against Carolina, Carolina's playing their players. Uh, We don't know if they'll be able to beat Carolina without some of their starters. We'll have to see. But the Packers, they're going to go out and they're going to win anyways. I think they want to go 13-3 and again for the second year in a row. Um, most likely, they're going to lock up that number one seed so that the road to the Super Bowl goes through wintry Green Bay. And that will be tough. Aaron Rodgers enjoys playing in cold weather. And you know what the most interesting scenario would be to me? Is if the Tampa Bay Buccaneers find themselves in the NFC Championship game in Green Bay against the Green Bay Packers. Why is that interesting? Well, a couple of scenarios. One, we always love to compare Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady. We've been doing it since day one. It's something we always do. It's Tom Brady's, you know, that that's the one person in his era that you can say probably throws a better football than him, has a stronger arm than him, has more talent than him but he doesn't have more wins than Tom Brady, right? That's the one thing you can always say. So we love to watch those two. Number two, the Green Bay Packers went to Tampa earlier this year and they got their butts kicked. They got destroyed. Is it a revenge factor? And then this is the most interesting aspect to me, this third and final one. Tom Brady played 20 years in New England. New England is a very cold place come January, February. Tom Brady's used to that weather. Tom Brady going to Green Bay, there's no issue there for him. But you know who's not used to that weather? The rest of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers team. Mike Evans has been playing in Tampa his whole life. Chris Godwin's been playing in Tampa his whole NFL life. All right, Gronk is the only one that has some experience of playing in cold playoff games. So, Can Tom Brady get that team ready to go if that's what happened? Remember, before the season started, my Super Bowl prediction was the Tampa Bay Buccaneers against the Kansas City Chiefs. I don't know if Tampa Bay is going to be able to go on this run to get there because I don't know if Bruce Arians is going to get out of the way to let them do that. Well, what do I mean by that? Bruce Arians, when Tampa Bay is at their best, It's when Bruce Arians is allowing Tom Brady to control the line of scrimmage. Well, you say, Kayvon, what do you mean by controlling the line of scrimmage? You're allowing Tom Brady to call the plays and audible out of the plays at the line of scrimmage. Bruce Arians calls in a play. Offensive coordinator Brian Lefwich calls in a play. 
Tom Brady says, no, 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 screw that play, we're doing this one. And he goes with the play that he likes. He does a dink and dunk, he throws it over the middle, he throws it to Gronk down the seam, and then he opens up the play action to throw it deep. That's how they're the best. They're at their worst when they come out and say, let's screw running the ball and let's try and throw it down the field 10, 15 times a game. Tom Brady is not made to throw the ball down the field 10 to 15 times a game. That's just not what he does, especially at this age. So is Bruce Arians going to be able to take a step back, understand that Tom Brady's the greatest quarterback that we've ever seen, that Tom Brady knows how to win playoff games, is he going to be able to step back and say, hey, let me let Tom Brady do this? I don't know. I hope he can, but I don't know if his ego is going to allow him to do that. We'll have to see. It comes into this question with the Bucs that I find so fascinating because right now, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are in a really interesting spot. What do I mean by that? Right now, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are sitting at the first wild card spot. They're sitting at 10-5, and five, and because the New Orleans Saints beat them twice, they won the division. So they're automatically going to have a home field playoff game. The Tampa Bay Bucks are going to have a wild card game, which means they're going to have to go on the road. But you know which team they would have to go play right now if the playoffs ended today? or if the playoffs started today, the winner of the NFC East, which is perfect for Brady and the Bucs. They're setting themselves up in a perfect manner. They go and play the winner of the NFC East, which, let's be honest, isn't that good this year, whether it's Dallas, whether it's the Giants, whether it's Washington. Yes, all three of those teams have played better as of late, but I don't think we would we all believe that any of those teams would beat Tampa Bay in a playoff game. So they would have the easiest playoff game right off the bat right there. Then if they win that, again, being the number one wild card spot, they would have to go on the road for every single game. Something that Tom Brady has not done before making in the Super Bowl. Remember. All of the years that Bill Belichick and Tom Brady made the Super Bowl, they had a first-round bye. Every single one of those years that they went to the Super Bowl, they went to the Super Bowl nine times, won six of them, they had a first-round bye for every single time they made it to the Super Bowl. They never made it to the Super Bowl without having at least a first-round bye. So Brady will have to do it different this year. He'll have to do it on the road. He has the winning pedigree. He'll be able to do that. He's just got to get the rest of the team mates on board. Can that happen? We'll have to see. So if you put the, if you set up where the playoffs look right now and you look at the Bucks going to play the NFC East winner, makes things very interesting, right? Can they do that? I'm sure they'll be able to go on the road, whether it's in Dallas, whether it's in New York, whether it's in Washington, and win that game. But it brings up an interesting question to me because – What would be a successful season for Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? In your your opinion, and reach out to me on Twitter, at Kayvon underscore sports, at GSMC underscore football, what would be a quote-unquote successful season for Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Would it be winning one playoff game? Would it be making it to the NFC uh, championship game? Is it just winning a playoff game? What are the expectations for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Or are we being too harsh? Have they already exceeded expectations no matter what? Why? Because they've won 10, maybe 11 games if they uh, win this week. We don't know if they're going to play their starters. In all likelihood, I think they will because that's what Bruce Arians likes to do. He likes to keep his offense in tune. He likes to keep them rolling, especially with the way they've been playing over the last couple of weeks. He wants to keep seeing that going. So 
Are they have they already exceeded expectations because they won eleven games, they won ten games, they made the playoffs for the first time since two thousand seven, and they've been a pretty good football team all year. Is that something that we can say? Okay, well, Tom Brady came here. Look what happened in New England. They fell apart. They're going to miss the playoffs for the first time in, what, since 2008? They're not going to have a winning season for the first time since Bill Belichick has taken over the football team. But he goes to a Tampa Bay team that was 7-9 and nine last year, and he completely flips them around, wins 10, maybe 11 games if they finish it out against the Falcons this week. Is that already a successful season? To me, it's not. When you have Tom Brady, when you have the GOAT, the best player ever to play the game of football, which he is, in my opinion, and many others, which I I don't even think it's that big of a debate anymore for what he's done, and now what he's showing that it's not just Bill Belichick, and I'm not of the opinion, and we'll get into this some other time, that, that whole debate of who was more important, Brady or Belichick, I still don't think that's written. It's not fair to criticize Belichick and say that he had nothing to do with that dynasty because he's having a bad year this year. Look, you should criticize Belichick for what's happened this year, but that book is not written. you got to give Belichick more time to rebuild this team up. It was a COVID year, a lot of opt-outs on defense. Their offense was anemic, which a lot has to do with him because of that, because of the situation he's put his players in by not drafting good players. So he's had a rough year. There is no doubt about that. And it's the, that, that whole rumor is starting to get hotter and hotter and hotter. That take, I should say. And if he isn't able to flip this New England Patriots team around soon, then yeah, they're in trouble. And yeah, Belichick, his, his reputation is going to take a hit. And it's always going to be Brady, 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 Brady. But we got to give Belichick more time. But what we can say is, Brady is able to be Brady even when he doesn't have Bill Belichick. That we can already write in the books, right? We can already check that off because he took a 7-9 team. I don't care how much talent they had. They had the exact same talent last year as well. The only difference, they brought in Brady and they brought in Gronk, okay? And, And Brady has completely flipped this franchise around. He's taken them to the playoffs, and now he gives them a chance to possibly make a playoff run. So, because you add Brady, because you add the go, and I don't care that he's 42 years old, he's still playing at a high level, he's still through for 4,234 yards, 36 touchdowns, that to me, you got to do more than just make the playoffs. Now, I'm not of the mindset that it's Super Bowl or bust, I'm not there, I think that the NFL is too hard, I think we'll be cutting the rest of the team short by doing that, it's too hard to win in this league. But I am of the mindset that they have to make the playoffs, which they have, so you can check that off. And I'm also of the mindset that they have to win a playoff game or two. They cannot lose in the first round, especially with the way that the bracket is shaping up. Which, like I just said earlier, they're going to play an NFC East uh, uh, winner. Washington, Dallas, Giants, who is it? You cannot lose that football game. It's a 7-9 and team. I get it that you're on the road. It does not matter to me. You have to go into that game. You have to win that game. And you have to move on from there. As long as they win one playoff game, maybe two, I will call this a successful year for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now, remember, my preseason pick was for them to make the Super Bowl. I still am holding out hope for that. I do not think that they are the best team. But I think that they have a chance to get and become the best team and become the hottest team in the playoffs because of Brady. Brady lives for the playoffs. That's when he shines the best, right? Can Brady rally this team to have a big run? They sure have the weapons. Their defense has been slacked off as of late. Todd Bowles is going to really have to get that defense going, especially in the secondary. They're young there, and they played good at first, but now they've really, really dropped off. So that's going to have to change. What is it for you guys at Cave on underscore sports? What is a successful season for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Are you guys saying that it's Super Bowl or bust for them? That's, I understand it. Let me know at Cave on underscore sports. This is the GSMC football podcast. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we will finish up the show. 
dive into segment number four, round it out with much more NFL, best bets, all of that and more. Coming back at you right after this short, short break. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Welcome back, welcome back. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. I am your host, Kayvon Izami. Hope everyone's having a lovely day, a lovely week. Thank you for taking your time uh, out of your busy day to listen to a little bit of our show. We really do appreciate it. We hope you guys are having a happy, happy holiday, whatever you're doing. Um, We really do hope that you're being safe and you're relaxing. You're enjoying some of your time off if you get it. Having a happy holiday as we turn the page from this horrendous 2020 year and we move on to the 2021 season. Loaded sports, college football all around, bowl games all around, uh, national semifinals coming up on Friday, Clemson, Ohio State, Alabama, Notre Dame. Um, I do not mean to uh, shortchange Notre Dame because they are a great football team. They're a great organization. I know it's college, but they still are an organization with the amount of money they bring in. Uh, but they, to me, they have zero shot against Alabama. Now, I think they could possibly keep it closer than a lot of experts think. But at the end of the day, Alabama will be moving on to the finals. So the big game comes down to that night game. Comes down to Clemson, Ohio State. Comes down to the rematch of last year. And let's, let's be honest. Let's be honest. Clemson and Dabo Sweeney have given Ohio State a lot of bulletin board material. Now, I know some of some people are not here for the cliches. They're not here. They're saying, look, it's college football. You can you can use all these cliches of uh, the other team wants it more. The other team's pissed off for the way they're talking about the other team. Blah, blah, blah. I get that. I do think that matters, though. I really do think that matters. And what I mean by that is when Dabo Sweeney comes out and says, Ohio State isn't even ranked in my top 10? Well, you better believe that Ryan Day, head coach of Ohio State, has put that all over the locker room and has woken up every day to talking to his team about it and has ended every day talking to his team about it. Dabo Sweeney, I get your point. I understand why you put them there. I think that it was based off of that, well, it was, this is what you said, that they don't. they didn't play enough games. Dabo Sweeney's exact quote was, look, they could come out and beat us. They could come out and win the whole thing. They are a very good football team. But I just can't put a team that played six games into the top ten. I understand that, Dabo. It's a fair point. But to me, you're too good of a coach. You've been here too many times to put out a statement like that. You're just adding fuel to the fire. was a fire that was already lit. Why? Because you beat them last year. They're already pissed off about that. And you didn't just boat race them last year. Remember, it came down to the final last play, and it came down to a controversial call as well that went Clemson's way. So it's not like this was some easy game. This is a very talented football in Ohio State. They've got a very talented quarterback in uh, Justin Fields, and they've got a very good coach in Ryan Day. And, and Dabo added fuel to the fire. And if I'm, if I'm a Clemson fan, I'm not very happy with what Dabo said because, you, yes, Clemson, you're the better team. Yes, Clemson, you have the better quarterback. But that Ohio State team is no joke, and you do not want to add any extra incentive 
for them to want to come out and play their best football. I think it's a good game. I think it's a close game. I do think Clemson ends up winning, but I think it's very, very close. I don't think it's going to be a blowout. I'm taking Ohio State plus the eight points. I think it's going to be a very entertaining game, just like last year. And as we talked about in the last segment, the most to prove in this game is Justin Fields. He has the most on the line, and I believe he's going to step up and show that he can do the damn thing and play some really good football and keep up with Trevor Lawrence. I believe that. Now, he might not win, but I believe he's going to be able to show what he's got. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. You know, we were just talking about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and you know what's amazing to me? Rob Gronkowski, you remember, he retired last year. So he came back from retirement this year. The first month of the season, he didn't even catch a ball pretty much. I think he caught like four passes in the first four games of the season. He pretty much was just a blocking tight end. Bruce Arians kept joking about how he's out of shape, and... He still has gone for 594 yards and seven touchdowns. And this has been a down year for Gronk. I mean, the the guy is a tremendous tight end. The rapport that him and Brady have together is, is one of a kind. And it's pretty special that the first four games, he really was only used to block, not to be an actual receiving tight end. And he has still had um, over half a thousand yards and seven touchdowns. He is going to be a weapon in the playoffs. That's where he also performs best, just like Brady. And those two are going to have to lead the rest of the team because Mike Evans, great receiver, never played in the playoffs. Chris Godwin, great receiver, never played in the playoffs. Antonio Brown starting to come on as of late, a touchdown in his last two games. He has played in the playoffs, um, so he has a little bit of uh, experience, but never played in the Super Bowl, never made it that far, right? So, it's going to be different. Bruce Arians, you know, he's been a head, he's been on coaching staffs that's gone far, but he himself as a head coach has never gone past the NFC Championship game. He did bring um, his Arizona Cardinals to the NFC Championship game the other a couple years ago uh, against the Panthers that 2015 year where the Panthers with uh, Cam Newton as the MVP, they ended up boat racing them in the NFC Champ game. Um, so he's gotten that far but he hasn't gone to the Super Bowl yet as a head coach. And all of that change. You know, it looks like the road to the Super Bowl is going to go through Green Bay. Tough weather, tough environment, no fans, but still a very tough place to play, especially if the weather is bad. Tom Brady's used to that. The rest of the team isn't. All right, now remember, the Super Bowl is in Tampa Bay. So there's history on the line here. If Tampa Bay is able to make it to the Super Bowl, they will be the first team ever in the history of the NFL to play in the Super Bowl in their own stadium. So that's something that could be very cool to see. We'll have to see if they'll make it. And if they do make it, it's going to be because their defense has played much better, not just their offense. They will not get there by just having great offense. It changes in the postseason. You have to have good defense, strong defense. You have to be able to run the ball. They're getting Ronald Jones back. They've got Leonard Fournette. Run the ball, play good defense, get to the quarterback, create turnovers. We, we keep talking about it. Can they do that? I don't know. We'll have to see. Do they have it in them? Of course they do. Do they have the talent? Of course they do. But can they bring it out and put it all together when it matters most? Now, I want to... This is the GSMC Football Podcast, by the way. I'm your host, Kayvon Izami. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I want to swing to the NFC East here, all right? We've got... I mean, it really is perfect for it to come down to the final game like this. It's it's a division we've kind of been making fun of all season long. A uh, division where pretty much every team has either underperformed or just been bad. Uh, some teams have come on as of late. Washington's played much better since Alex Smith has become under QB. And then he gets hurt the, these last two games. They lose because he's not able to be out there and play. You see the big difference, right? And really, a lot of credit to Alex Smith and just the the perseverance he showed it's such a great story you know the guy almost has his leg taken off gets infected he can't walk he fights his way back plays football again doesn't just play football but plays winning football again it's scary to watch him play because of everything he's went through it's scary to watch him get hit but you know what he keeps persevering he keeps playing well and it, it's such a just 
compliment to him and his toughness, his bravery, his tenacity, his love for the game, and his love to win and help his teammates out. And look, you know, not to get on a whole thing here, but he really has had a remarkable career. If you guys remember his career, he was the number one overall pick, right? And his first couple years, it looked like he was going to be a bust when he was with San Francisco. He ends up turning his career around completely, makes it to the NFC Championship game with the 49ers, Harbaugh as his coach. They end up trading him because Colin Kaepernick's right behind him, comes in, plays a little bit better. Harbaugh feels like Colin Kaepernick can get them over to the over the hump, which he almost does. They take him, they go to the Super Bowl, they almost win, but they lose to Joe Flacco and the Ravens, who were on a very hot run that year. He goes to Kansas City. All he does is in Kansas City, um, Alex Smith is win, you know, win games, go to the playoffs every single year, 11 and 5, 12 and 4, 10 and 6, every single year, win, win, win. He then, the, the Chiefs, then they go 12 and 4, they lose in the first round of the playoff game. The next year they draft Patrick Mahomes. He doesn't complain about it. He sits there, he mentors Mahomes, he lets Mahomes learn everything. He doesn't shortcut anything. He, he, opens his brain he opens the book for Mahomes and Mahomes to this day many many times has been on record saying he wouldn't be as good as he is if it wasn't for what Alex Smith did to him in his first year I mean if you think about it Mahomes really had the best possible situation out there and I'm that I'm not saying that's why he's a great football player but it does help you know you you get drafted to a great organization with a great coach with a lot of offensive skill sets right not only that, you get to sit for a year and learn from one of the best mentors out there. And then you get to take over. I mean, it, it was a perfect scenario. Alex Smith was a great guy about it. He then goes to Washington. In his first year in Washington, he, he has them 6-4. and four. They're winning football games under Alex Smith. Then he gets uh, that, that rough injury. We think he's never going to play anymore. And now he's come back and he's led this team um, to a 6-9 and nine record. Not really. Actually, under them, he you know, under Alex Smith, they've won more than they've lost. Um, remember the first four games of the season, they started Dwayne Haskins, who has now been cut. They 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 didn't do very much there. They lost. Then they tried to start Kyle uh, Allen, who then got hurt. So their only option was to bring in Alex Smith. And since bringing in Alex Smith, they've completely turned the ship around. Um, and and now it comes down to. You win against the Eagles on Sunday night football, and you're in. Can they do it? If Alex Smith is out there, yes, they can. If Alex Smith is not out there, then they have zero shot. It's unfortunate. They're really banged up right now. Terry McLaurin is hurt. I don't know if he's going to play. I do think Antonio Gibson will be able to play. Look, the only way that they're going to win this game is by riding their defense. The defense that has been their strong suit all year, and do what they have done best when they kind of turned things around and went on that four-game win streak. What did they do best? They played tough defense. They got to the opposing quarterback. They created sacks. They created turnovers. And they didn't turn the ball over on offense. That's what was so key about Alex Smith. He was so good at not turning the ball over. He just, yeah, look, he might be boring to watch. He might be the simple dink and dunk, no over-the-top throws, anything like that. But he got the job done. He didn't turn over the football. He got the job done. And at the end of the day, that's all you can ask for. If you see the big difference, when he got hurt, Dwayne Haskins comes in. He throws interception after interception after interception. He fumbles the ball. He turns the ball over. He makes the defense have to be out there for long periods of time. He puts the defense in bad situations. They can't be as dominant when they're in that position. I don't care how good of a defense you are. If your offense puts you in bad positions, it's just not going to work out very well for you, right? That's what Alex Smith does best. He might not light up the scoreboard. He might not throw for 400 yards and four touchdowns. But what he will do is he'll control the game clock. He'll make smart decisions. He will not lose the turnover battle. And he will make sure that the defense gets their rest. He'll have first downs. He'll let the clock roll. He'll give the defense the rest that they need. So then when they come out, they can be full strength. They can use that, you know, that, that 
tenacity that they have on the defensive line with guys like Montez Sweat, Chase Young, Ryan Kerrigan, uh, uh, one of the best defensive lines in the league. If they can do that, if Alex Smith can play, Washington should be able to win this game. If Alex Smith cannot play, then goodbye, Washington. Hello, winner of the Dallas-New York game. When you look between the Cowboys and the Giants, the Cowboys are definitely playing better football right now. They definitely have a better roster, offensively, not defensively. The Giants are the much better team on defense. The Cowboys are the much better team on offense. If this game tries to go into a shootout, Dallas will win the game. New York cannot allow that to happen. If the Giants want to win this game, they have to play on their pace. What does that mean? They have to keep it a low-scoring game, under 44, under 45 points, run the football, create turnovers, make Andy, you know Andy Dalton can throw picks. He, he can throw interceptions. Bring pressure, make him throw those interceptions, make him feel uncomfortable, make him force the ball into some of those good receivers' hands and some of those good receiver windows. And then when you're on offense, do not turn the ball over. Settle for field goals, that's fine. You can win the game that way. You can fully win the game that way. And and I believe that the Giants can do that. They're at home. The weather might be a little cold. Then they have a chance to win the game. There's no doubt about that. But if they try and, and not shut down, if they can't get pressure on Andy Dalton, if they can't shut down that offense, if they let them go up and down the field and score like Philadelphia did, they have no shot. Just because the Giants' offense is not strong enough the, the, yet, yeah, right? Maybe they can get there one day, but the Giants do not have enough offensive firepower to go into a shootout with Dallas. They're going to have to win this game like 17-10. to 10. That, that's, that's honestly how I feel like they're going to have to win this game. In, in a low-scoring, under-20-point type of game, right? 14-10, 20-17, something like that. If it starts to get into the 27-28, 27-21, 28, you know, the 35 type range, it's, it's just not going to work. Dallas will be too much better on offense. They have too much to ask for on the offensive side of the ball. Um, I think Joe Judge will get his team ready for this. The, the Giants have been on a bit of a losing streak since they, you know, turned things around. They shocked the world. They beat... Um, they, they, they beat the Seattle Seahawks in Seattle, and since then, they've kind of fallen off a bit. And remember, Tampa Bay Buccaneers will be playing the winner of the NFC East. Remember how Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay and New York, the, the Giants game went earlier this season on Monday Night Football? The Giants played Tampa very well. It came down to a two-point conversion by the Giants that they were not able to get from tying the game going to overtime. The game would be in New York. New York has had some great success against Tom Brady in the playoffs before, albeit a different team. That could be some interesting storylines right there, right? Could be some very interesting storylines. So we're going to have to get to that point. But remember, Washington is in no matter what, as all all they have to do is win. If they win, they're in. That's why they're the, the night game. That's why they're the Sunday night game. Dallas and New York, if you win, you're in as long as Washington loses. So you still got to win that game, and then you got to hope that Washington loses. So Washington has the ball in their court. It's all in their court. They can do this if they win the football game against the Philadelphia Eagles. It's going to be Jalen Hurts at the helm. The Philadelphia Eagles are the only team that's sitting there at 4-10-1 that is eliminated from not being able to make the playoffs. So we will see how things go there. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. I am your host, Kayvon Izami. As we look down the last couple of games here on the on the Week 17 slate, that really means something. Because remember, a lot of these games, they, they just uh, they're going to be a lot resting a lot of players. Doesn't matter. So the one team in the AFC that is looking outside, looking into the playoffs right now, is the Indianapolis Colts. They really blew this game against the Steelers. If they won against the Steelers, they would be in, right? That, that they would be good to go. But since they lost against the Steelers, now they need some help. 
which is unfortunate because I actually think Indianapolis is a better team than the Cleveland Browns. I know Cleveland beat them in earlier in the season. I think they're both different teams now. I think Indianapolis, if they played again, would win that game. So I think Indianapolis would actually give a team like Buffalo or a team like Baltimore much more fits than, let's say, the Browns would. I, I think right now, if the Browns went into Buffalo, I think Buffalo beats them by 14 points. I think if the Colts went into Buffalo, I think that could be a toss-up ball game because the Colts' defense is so much better than the Browns. The Colts' defense is one of the best defenses in the league. So that is going to be the most interesting storyline to me, all right? Because the Colts, unfortunately, are not getting any favors from the Pittsburgh Steelers. I I'm sure the Colts were really hoping that Pittsburgh would play Ben Roethlisberger, they would play their starters against the Browns, which gives them a much better chance to beat the Browns while the Colts get to play Jacksonville. So the Colts have to beat Jacksonville, which they should be able to do pretty easily, and then they have to hope that either the Browns, the Ravens, or the Dolphins lose. Now, since the Browns are playing the Pittsburgh Steelers without most of their starters, without Big Ben, they should win that game. If they don't win that game, that... That is going to be very, very bad for Baker Mayfield and the Cleveland Browns. The Ravens are playing the Bengals. The Ravens have been one of the hottest football teams in the country these last four or five weeks. They should beat the Bengals. Even though the Bengals have been on a win streak here and have played good football as of late, they should still take care of the Ravens with no... I mean, uh, the Ravens should still take care of them with no issues. So, now if I'm the Indianapolis Colts, I'm turning my focus to one game. And that is the Miami Dolphins against the Buffalo Bills. Miami has to win to get in, right? Buffalo is going to play their starters. They're going to play Josh Allen. They're going to play Stephon Diggs. They want to keep this ball rolling, which I totally feel them. They want that number two seed no matter what so that they can host Pittsburgh or host someone in a playoff game in the second round, in the divisional round. So they're going to play everyone. So the Colts' best chance is for the Buffalo Bills to beat Miami, and then Indianapolis would be able to sneak in there. Look, the, 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 the Dolphins almost lost to Vegas last week. So, so the Colts almost got their prayer right there. It did not happen, so now it's going to come down to the final game of the season. And if I'm the Colts, the Browns should beat the Steelers without Big Ben. The Ravens should be beat the Bengals with no issue. So it comes down to, can the Dolphins beat the Buffalo Bills? And the way the Buffalo Bills are playing right now, I don't know if they can. So that's the game that I would focus on most if I'm an Indianapolis Colts fan. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. Um, I really, really thank you all for tuning in during this holiday week. Thank you for listening to the GSMC Football Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show, write a nice review. It really does help us out. Also, if you can, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great night. Have a great holiday weekend. Happy New Year, and we'll talk to you next year. Been wanting to say that for a long time. We will talk to you next year. Have a good one. Be safe. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. 